Simona, over to you. Thank you so very much, uh, Excellencies, distinguished participants and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the event titled uh, Innovative Financing Schemes and Policies to Unlock Human Potential. Uh, the event is organized by the Government of the Republic of Benin uh, alongside the 2023 High Level Political Forum, a body of the uh, ECOSOC at the United Nations that reviews every year, as you know, progress that countries are making on the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, this is the time of the year when countries need to come to the truth to present their uh, progress uh, towards the 2030 agenda. Um, allow me to also thank the Sustainable Development Solutions Network of the United Nations for assisting with the organization of this event and for the documents that are going to be presented. As you could see uh, through the agenda, our event is structured in three parts. We will have an opening uh, segment to set the stage for a discussion that will look both into the progress that countries are making on the SDGs, as well as on the financing solutions to keep uh, progress uh, going. Uh, the introduction will be followed by the uh, presentation of the Benin Sustainable Development Report 2023, that will be delivered by um, SDSN, after which we will have a panel discussion on innovative financing to unlock sustainable human development. We talk about uh, how governments uh, have taken the bold um, action towards mobilizing um, financing in capital markets, um, and we will talk to investors, to asset managers, to the International Monetary Fund as the institution uh, monitoring uh, financial markets uh, globally. And um, I am also uh, extremely grateful to all of the participants, speakers today, government representatives of the Republic of Benin and as well as of Uzbekistan that will speak about their specific experience in raising uh, ESG debt to fund national development plans and uh, also uh, financial institutions, representatives, experts, as I mentioned. I would like to um, uh, give the floor to the opening address. I'm just checking is, if uh, Mr. Armand uh, Taku, uh, Director of Cabinet, Ministry of Economy and Finance of the Republic of Benin, is online for the opening address. Uh, just uh, waiting for a confirmation. If not, I'm uh, going to um, invite uh, Guillaume Lafortune, uh, Vice President of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, to present the report um, and give the floor as soon as possible to the representative of the government of uh, the Republic of Benin. So just testing, um, uh, Monsieur Taku, vous avez la parole. Not yet, so we will, with, with your permission, um, I will just invite uh, SDSN to present the report. Maybe just a brief uh, introduction as we are waiting for uh, the government to also be present uh, for the opening segment. Uh, SDSN produces for many years now um, sustainable development reports, a global report that is always launched in June. Um, at this time, um, uh, around the Paris summit, we had an opportunity to look at the progress uh, globally, as well as country reports uh, using an SDG index and also six transformations, a very interesting uh, approach, as the SDGs are so interlinked. So there is no progress towards any of them without um, um, making the same uh, level of, of progress across. Um, I would like to give the floor to Guillaume Lafortune, again, Vice President of SDSN for the presentation. Guillaume, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Simona. And um, I do believe we do have the, the teams in, in Cotonou Benin uh, connected, maybe not all the panelists, but we, we do have, uh, I believe, a, a big team in, in, in Benin connected to the, to the event. I mean, look, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm connecting from New York, from the where, where the high-level political forum just started and has Simona mentioned this event is uh, an official side event of um, this year's um, HLPF, um, and I'm particularly happy to uh, present uh, in a moment the, the, the key findings and results of the second edition of this Benin Sustainable Development Report. 
But before diving into the, the, the results and, and sharing a, a few slides, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of background around this, um, this report and this partnership that SDSN has with, with Benin since 2021 now. So Simona mentioned it, we just released a few weeks ago on the sidelines of the Paris Summit for a Global Financing Pact, um, the 2023 edition of the Sustainable Development Report, which includes the SDG index and dashboards, right? So every year we track as the ascended performance of all UN member states on the SDGs. And of course, this is no surprise. The main findings is that um, globally we're, we're not on track. Actually, we're not on track at all um, to achieve those goals by 2030. And what's quite worrying is when we look at the gap between high income countries and lower income and lower middle income countries on SDG outcomes, when we extrapolate the trends over the, the past two to three years, we see by that, that by 2030, the gap might be even larger between rich and poor countries on SDG outcomes than where it was in 2015. So that would mean basically a complete loss uh, of a loss of convergence in sustainable development outcomes over that period, which was, of course, not at all the objectives when we started this agenda. So HLPF, of course, is very important to recommit to this agenda. But of course, there's a very important SDG summit um, coming up in, in, in September, followed, of course, I mean, there will be before that an important G20 meeting in, in India, a COP28 in Dubai, and then a summit for the future also in, in September 2024. But it's very important now that we double down um, on policies, but also on financing for this, um, for this agenda. Um, one of the challenges that a lot of the low income, lower middle income countries and emerging economies um, more generally are facing is a fiscal space issue. And one of the problems is that some countries managed to mobilize 17 trillion and plus um, on COVID-19 recovery packages. This is not the case for many countries around the world that face major challenges when it comes to borrowing to invest into the human capital and the physical infrastructure needed to achieve the SDGs. Uh, so there's two major problems, the cost of borrowing, the interest rates paid that often exceed eight, nine, 10% in many of those countries, but also the, 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 the length um, of, the, of the borrowing, the, the, the maturity, which is often very, very short. So in that context, it's very interesting to look at some of those innovative financing instruments that have been developed uh, over the, 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 the past couple of years, especially on, at the sovereign side, to try to address some of those issues. And Benin is one of those countries, and when we will have the interventions from the government, they will speak about the process and um, the, the background for the issuance um, back in, in July 2021 of the first African SDG bond. But this is an instrument where um, that, that allowed to address some of those issues um, that allowed Benin to borrow at the lower at lower cost than um, it usually borrows, but also that has an average maturity of 12.5 years, which is, of course, very important to have these kinds of maturity when you want to invest into infrastructure type of projects that take years to materialize and, and human capital um, also. So at SDSN, from the very beginning, we, you know, we were extremely happy uh, to work um, with Benin um, on um, monitoring the implementation of um, SDG policies in the in the country. And so what we do in this context is each year we take stock of the progress made by Benin, both in terms of the, the outcomes um, that are being achieved and also um, in terms of the, the development of the, of the policies. So as such, it's, um, it's part of the broader, let's say, governance framework of the bond that there's an independent monitoring um, each year of the, the progress towards the goals that uh, Benin is, is making. And this is what I'll be presenting over the next um, around uh, 10 minutes. Um, I'll be sharing my screens because there's a lot of great visuals. I just want to, again, um, thank uh, the, the, um, the team that is leading the development of this report. I'm doing the presentation here, but there's a whole team um, that, are, that, are really, um, that are really doing the work. So in particular, the team at the government of Benin, but also my colleague at this DSN, Samori Fouré, who's the lead, um, the lead analyst on this assessment. So you see it here, this, um, this, and I hope you can all see my slide. Maybe Simona, you can give me a thumbs up if uh, that's the case. Yeah, good. Um, so this is part of a broader series of um, assessments that um, the SDSN has been doing now since 2016. We do this at the global um, level, um, but we also do this at the regional level. So each year we also work with um, European partners on a European um, edition. Um, 
we have also we're doing work with with Latin America and also we track what's going on within countries um, as well. So when I say what those reports do is they take uh, a number of indicators in the case of the global edition, it's around 100 um, that are then um, grouped uh, across the SDGs. We define um, what represents um, SDG achievement on all the indicators. We aggregate this at the goal level, and then it creates an assessment of where we're standing on the SDGs. And then we can calculate whether countries are on, on track or off track um, to achieve um, to achieve the, the goals. And I'm not spending too, too long on the methodology because a lot has been said and a lot is also available online, but we've been peer reviewed by Nature Geoscience, Cambridge University Press, and this methodology has been also statistically audited, the 2019 edition by the European Commission Joint Research Center. So we've done all the steps necessary to make sure that this was as scientific um, as it can be. So this is, I mean, what the first um, slide is, is showing is um, the overall um, situation at midpoint on the SDGs in Benin. And what this assessment, the assessment this year is, is doing is um, comparing the results of Benin uh, versus other countries um, in the uh, CDAO, uh, the CDAO region, um, which includes, of course, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cabo Verde, Côte d'Ivoire, Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Sierra, Sierra Leone and Togo. Um, so a lot of the assessments is based on, I mean, we compare it to the to what's going on globally, but also specifically against the region. And you see here that at midpoint, basically, we evaluate that um, that Benin is um, has a score, an SDG index score of 50.4%, uh, percent, which is now slightly uh, above um, the population weighted uh, regional average. But then what's even more interesting is to look across um, the goals at the various um, challenges um, and, um, and, 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 um, and, uh, and trajectories and, and progress that the country is, is making. And um, we see here that there are um, important challenges, but there's also some signs of progress on uh, many of the goals, including, and I'll be sharing a few slides in a, sec uh, in a moment, but on reducing extreme poverty, for instance, on decent work, on industry and innovation um, as well. And of course, as many uh, low income and lower middle income uh, countries, Benin performs much better than many of um, the high income countries on SDG 12 and 13 related to responsible consumption, production and, and climate action. Even though here also the, the, we need to look at uh, the trends, um, uh, the, 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 the trends uh, over time as well, but in terms of um, performance, um, th those goals are, are um, uh, Benin performs fairly well right now on, on those goals. Um, I think when we look at, at the trends, it's actually quite interesting to see where Benin started back in 2015 compared with neighboring countries and where it stands right now. So when we look at um, trends over time, we see that um, you know in 2015, um, our, our estimate was below, Benin was below the, the CDAO region um, and in 2022, Benin is now um, above the average for the region. So we estimate that Benin is progressing at the rate of one uh, percentage point per year on average um, uh, over, the, over the period um, versus 0 0.2 points for the CDAO region. So essentially five times um, faster. And um, a lot of the progress is driven by um, significant reduction in extreme poverty rates, reduction in income inequalities, and also a sharp um, increase in access to HIV treatment among, among others. So of course here I, I'm not going into all the, the details. This is described in the, in, the, in the report, but those are some of the, the drivers. Another way to look at it because the SDG score might not be um, speaking to, um, to those that don't know the methodology, but we can also assess you know, the percentage of um, SDG targets that, um, that are uh, on track to be achieved or where there's limited progress or those that are moving backwards. And here we see that Benin is at about 20% of the target that are um, either achieved or, or, or on track, which is also um, above the, the average for the, um, the CDAO um, region. Of course, there's you know, more than uh, a quarter of the target that are also not necessarily going in the right direction. To, so those require um, some, some attention um, as well. Um, so I mentioned that one of the, the, the interesting findings is, is, is to see um, the reduction in uh, extreme poverty in Benin since um, the adoption of, of, of the SDGs. 
Um, these are um, people that live with less than $2.15 um, USD per day um, and $3.65 per day. And you see here that there's been a, a really significant reduction which exceeded um, the average um, reduction in extreme poverty observed in um, countries of the, of the Sidiao um, region. Of course, you know, here I'm going quite quickly over those results, but all of this um, indicator by indicator, goal by goal is available in the report and accompanied, of course, by uh, a much um, more detailed analysis of the key results and finding. But of course, this is one data point per country and one data point per country, as we know, might hide some uh, disparities in SDG um, outcomes within um, countries. So we have also um, a methodology to um, track um, what is happening also at the subnational um, level. Um, so we've worked with many, many countries around the world, and we've applied this also to the case of Benin. And we see here that there are um, indeed some disparities across um, the 12 uh, departments in, um, in Benin. Um, quite often, the, the littoral uh, region around Cotonou um, uh, is, is at the higher level of SDG uh, performance or, or outcomes than some of the, the, the northern um, departments, um, including um, Atacora or um, Alibori, um, for, for instance. And these, what you see here is, and, and this year's report has a strong focus on education, gender, and inequality. What in SDSN is the first transformation out of six transformations that we call for at the, SD, uh, for the SDGs. This is transformation one. And, the transformation too is on health, um, well-being, and uh, demography, and this is the focus of this year's um, edition. The other six transformations are related to energy um, decarbonization. The fourth one is on sustainable land use, oceans, and, and biodiversity preservation. The fifth one is on sustainable cities, and the sixth one is on harnessing the digital revolution. So this year's assessment focuses a lot um, of this Benin report on transformation one and two on education, gender inequality, and health well-being and, and demography. And so here you have um, the, the, the scores of a, a leave no one behind index that we prepared for this report. And there's, you see here two of the pillars of this leave no one behind index, one on the accessibility of services on the left-hand side, and the other one is on uh, extreme poverty and ma material um, deprivation. And these are the gaps across sub-regions. Um, so this is for the, outcomes, the performance, the results in terms of SDG um, progress and, and, and targets. Um, but it's also interesting to, to look at um, the development of um, institutional leadership and policies to achieve the SDGs, because that might actually send a, uh, a strong signal around the willingness of a, of a country to move towards the SDGs and whether a country is, is on track um, when it comes to its um, policy framework and, and investment frameworks to achieve the SDGs. And so at SDSN, we've been doing work on this um, since 2016, um, also including with, with the OECD, and, and we published a lot of you know, working papers and, and research outputs. And we, we work with a concept, conceptual framework that looks at countries' political leadership and institutional coordination for the SDGs, the integration of the SDGs into sectoral policies and pathways, and countries' commitment to multilateralism under the UN Charter, because the SDGs are a global responsibility, whether it's for you know, climate action, um, cybersecurity, peace, all of those challenges require cooperation. So we also integrate um, the uh, commitment of countries to, to work with others um, as an important component of countries' efforts and commitments to the SDGs. And we take um, a number of key proxy indicators across all those three pillars, and we aggregate this as a as a, as a score of government efforts and commitments. And in the case of the Benin report, we dive into some of the latest developments in terms of um, the policies and integration of SDGs into public management practices and, and procedures. So I'm going quite, quite fast, but these are some of the proxy measures, right? So on political leadership and institutional coordination, SDSN has its own primary data collection collected from our global network of um, researchers and, and scientists from all over the world. So we look at whether countries have done at the midpoint of voluntary national review, whether there's a coordination unit in government for the SDGs, whether um, there's a monitoring system, a set of national indicator sets, whether we see references to the SDGs in the national budget. And then 
We also look at the integration of the SDGs into sectoral pathways, um, so across the six transformations, and then um, the commitment to multilateralism, the percentage of treaties um, that countries have ratified of the UN, membership in UN organizations, um, and other measures to promote demilitarization, peace, and, and so on. Um, and so here also, it's actually quite interesting. So this is not from the Benin report from our global assessment that was just released, but the bottom line here, and we have results for 74 countries. The bottom line here is that um, Benin um, ranks actually number five. So it's, it's in the top five this year of uh, our assessment of government efforts and commitments um, for the SDGs. The other countries at the top uh, are European countries, including Sweden, Switzerland, Netherlands, and, and Finland. Um, and at the very bottom, there's three countries that stand out with, um, you know, as countries that talk very little about SDGs and and have um, and have less a lower level of commitment. Those are the Russian Federation, Israel, and the United States. And as one example, at the midpoint, um, we've got um, 188 countries that have taken part in the VNR process. Five countries have not taken part in in VNR process. These are Haiti, Yemen. South Sudan, Myanmar, and the United States, Benin has um, uh, presented three VNRs already to the United Nations. And so to, to conclude, and because I think other speakers will do a much better job, but you know, there's um, very, very clearly in Benin a strong commitment, and this is part of the report, a snapshot of the institutional um, governance um, uh, framework, let's say, or, or institutional arrangements for um, SDG implementation in, in Benin, uh, which is very, um, uh, which is uh, very um, uh, advanced and, and, and ambitious. And um, we track also inside the report some of the key metrics and look at the policy development in, in, in Benin um, in terms of um, integration of, of gender um, in, in, in the law. So this is a World Bank metrics, um, whether uh, there's efforts to um, reduce inequalities. This is an Oxfam uh, assessment, from, for instance, and other metrics on the number of uh, free and compulsory, compulsory year of education in the law, for instance. So you see these are more inputs and, and process measures. So we track this also every year um, in this assessment. So I'll stop here. I've been a bit longer than, than expected, but I, I, I hope I paid justice to the great work that's been done um, as part of this report from the government of, of Benin, but also from at, at the SDSN, the, the team of, of researchers that are involved. The report is accessible online uh, since this morning. You have the web link here. I invite all of you to also take a look at the data visualization a tool that has been produced alongside the um, report. And uh, finally, just to say that our the rest of our broader work on SDG pathways, policies, and financing is available in our um, flagship platform that was also released a few weeks ago, the, this new SDG Transformation Center. And I'll stop here and hand it uh, back to you. Thank you uh, very much. More. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. Remarkable progress, great commitment, uh, a good success story for other countries to follow. We look forward to an analysis as to how the ESG that, so that that raised for uh, investments that observe environmental, social, and, and governance standards and safeguards have contributed to this great progress. We will hear from two countries, from uh, Benin and from uh, Uzbekistan. So I'm very pleased to um, introduce a distinguished panel that will take this topic of SDG progress to link it to financing. Uh, in um, uh, the panel on the podium uh, this morning, this afternoon with me, Professor Alastair Alin Sato, uh, Chief of Staff at the Ministry of Development um, in the um, Government of the Republic of Benin, uh, Mr. Rodrigue Shaou, uh, Director General of the Budget, Ministry of Economy and Finance, Republic of Benin, uh, Mr. Obijon Kakimov, um, Director of Center for Economic Research and Reform under the Administration of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan um, in Central Asia, uh, the first uh, uh, SDG. Uh, bond issuer um, after Benin, um, and uh, then uh, Mr. Cedric Merle, Head of Center of Expertise and Innovation and ESG Coverage for um, Sovereign um, Supranational Agency that at uh, Natixis Green and Sustainable Hub. Uh, Ms. Camille Barre, um, who is a socially responsible investment analyst at Mirova, and Ms. Che, Kei Chang, a senior research officer at the International Monetary Fund. Again, it is all about expanding space 
uh, identifying ways to uh, mobilize uh, resources in a capital market that uh, lacks uh, trust uh, when it's about developing uh, countries, a topic that um, has been uh, since 2022 from the launch of the Bridgetown Initiative on the table, then reflected into the SDG stimulus of the United Nations and um, followed by a, an interesting outcome of the Paris Summit. So it's all about raising sustainable debt, debt that is linked to uh, sustainable development goals, to uh, more inclusive, um, sustainable human development. And we will hear how this is possible. Uh, Professor Alastair Alinsato, I will start with you. Um, you are a highly knowledgeable professional in the field of sustainable development uh, goals uh, in Benin, uh, following the interesting process of mobilizing financing for the SDGs. We would like to understand what the recent developments um, are regarding the monitoring and the implementation framework of the 2030 agenda in uh, Benin. Um, you mentioned the organization of voluntary local reviews and the National Forum on SDGs. Um, mentioned that, uh, Guillaume, into your presentation as well. What are the upcoming steps and other prospects for the countries? Benin, a good story for other countries to follow. We look forward to your words, uh, Professor Alin Sato. Isabella Parole. Okay, merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame, pour cette uh, très bonne introduction et aussi énergique, hein, donc, qui montre effectivement que nous sommes dans, en plein dans les ODD. Je voudrais. Euh, avant de répondre à votre question, saluer SDSN et tous les organisateurs de, de ce panel qui nous permet de célébrer encore euh, le Bénin dans le cadre du forum politique de haut niveau. Et euh, pour répondre à la question, je vais, euh, pour faire court aussi, je vais tout simplement m'accentuer sur les, les développements les plus récents, notamment ceux intervenus entre euh, disons, le, le panel de l'année dernière et aujourd'hui. Donc, qu'est-ce qui a changé euh, sur la dernière année en termes, justement, d'engagement gouvernemental euh, dans la mise en œuvre des ODD? Alors, comme vous l'avez bien annoncé dans, dans le mot introductif, nous avons euh, fait une analyse après la priorisation des ODD, nous avons procédé à leur spatialisation, c'est-à-dire que nous avons chercher à voir euh, euh, quelles sont les priorités euh, en matière d'ODD qui se dégagent pour chaque commune du Bénin. Et après avoir fait cet ODD, nous avons donc euh, un, un map, euh, une forme de cartographie des ODD les plus pertinentes par commune au Bénin. Et nous avons, euh, à l'issue de cet ODD, nous sommes rendus compte que plus de 60 des ODD ont plutôt euh, un, un impact local beaucoup plus prononcé. C'est-à-dire que euh, en suivant le principe de subsidiarité, euh, l'efficacité dans la mise des ODD euh, serait, euh, va s'améliorer de plus de 60 si les gouvernements locaux, les gouvernements communaux euh, euh, s'investissaient davantage dans la mise en œuvre des ODD. Donc, pour justement les engager, euh, donc euh, les, les mettre à bord de cette dynamique-là vers les ODD, nous avons euh, organisé euh, sur cette dernière année euh, les examens locaux volontaires. L'idée donc des examens locaux volontaires, c'est d'amener chaque commune à produire un, un rapport d'examen local volontaire à l'instar de ce que les pays font au forum politique de haut niveau. Et donc, euh, euh, pour cette première expérience, nous avons 77 communes au Bénin, plus d'une quarantaine ont candidaté justement au processus des armées locales volontaires, c'est-à-dire que plus d'une quarantaine de communes ont fait le choix d'exposer euh, au grand public et de se soumettre à l'évaluation du grand public et des pairs euh, leur démarche euh, de mise en œuvre des ODD. Et nous avons sélectionné quatre communes pour cette première expérience, compte tenu justement des contraintes logistiques que nous avons. Mais euh, euh, il faut dire que euh, l'ensemble des 77 communes étaient effectivement présentes euh, au Forum national sur les ODD, qui est le cadre que nous avons mis en place pour permettre 
à chaque commune sélectionnée, donc les quatre communes que nous avons sélectionnées sur plus d'une quarantaine de candidatures, d'exposer leur rapport d'examen local. Donc ça nous a permis d'identifier les gaps existants encore dans les communes et ça nous a permis aussi d'enregistrer eh, les success stories, les, les bonnes pratiques au niveau donc, des communes euh, à l'échelle vraiment locale qui permettent vraiment de booster les ODD. Et donc, les examens locaux volontaires ont permis de produire les rapports et le Forum national sur les ODD a permis justement d'exposer, de présenter ces rapports-là, de les soumettre à l'évaluation des pairs euh, dans un cadre qui a réuni euh, tous les maires du Bénin, tous les préfets du Bénin, les ministres qui sont euh, euh, sur la question des ODD pendant près d'une semaine. Ça, ça a été un changement majeur, euh, une nouveauté, je vais dire, une innovation dans le processus de mise en œuvre des ODD. Deuxièmement, si j'ai encore une minute, je vais compléter et dire que nous avons aussi, en termes d'innovation, le gouvernement, a, 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 après avoir évalué l'environnement de mise en œuvre des ODD, et après s'être rendu compte que 60 des ODD sont beaucoup plus efficaces lorsqu'elles sont mises en œuvre de façon effective au niveau local, à identifier ce que nous avons appelé des accélérateurs des ODD. Et nous avons en moyenne, au Bénin, nous avons identifié autour de 5 à 6 accélérateurs. Le gouvernement a décidé donc de mettre en place des programmes, un programme spécial d'accélération du développement du rapport commun. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes à l'échelle, je vais dire, pilote. Donc, nous avons finalisé ce programme pour une commune. C'est un programme de trois ans et qui tourne autour donc, de cinq à six accélérateurs. Nous avons les écoles primaires, et, et vous voyez très bien dans le rapport présenté par euh, Guillaume que le Bénin fait très bien en termes de taux de scolarisation primaire. Nous avons les centres de santé, nous avons les infrastructures marchandes, c'est-à-dire les marchés où euh, les, 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 les agriculteurs, les paysans, les hommes et les femmes viennent, viennent échanger leurs biens. Nous avons le désenclavement des communes. Nous avons parfois certaines communes qui sont très enclavées, difficiles d'accès, difficiles aussi euh, de déplacer les productions des champs vers les infrastructures marchandes. Donc, nous avons un programme de désenclavement. Nous avons un programme d'accès à l'eau potable et nous avons l'électricité. Donc, voilà les six accélérateurs euh, autour desquels un mini-programme de trois ans est mis en place pour les communes. Et à cette étape pilote, la seule commune qui fait l'objet de cette expérience, c'est 500 millions de dollars donc, qui sont mobilisés pour cette commune afin de faire des avancées euh, importantes dans ces six domaines que j'ai cités. Je rappelle pour finir, les écoles primaires, les centres de santé, l'eau potable, l'électricité, les infrastructures marchandes et puis le désenclavement donc, des communes. Donc, voilà un peu ce qui a fondamentalement changé sur ces douze euh, derniers mois, donc sur cette dernière année au Bénin et qui euh, ici témoigne encore de l'engagement du gouvernement, euh, de la volonté du gouvernement de conduire le pays sur euh, le sentier qui nous mène d'ici 2030, effectivement, à l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable. Merci. Professeur uh, Alin Sato, je vous remercie. Incredible, incredible analysis as to what works in the implementation of the SDGs. Development is fundamentally local. Localizing the agenda creates more ownership at the village level, at the community level, which um, in the case of Benin played such an important role in generating progress. I think if I may, Professor, um, Benin is educating investors as to how taking that particular avenue, um, uh, providing, uh, showing confidence in governments that are capable of putting forward such policies and such interesting projects uh, could, could uh, achieve progress. and, and uh, provide uh, higher returns of uh, on investment. So great, great example. We look forward to learning more of the results moving forward. And uh, in my capacity, um, I have not had an opportunity to introduce myself um, as a senior advisor covering small island developing states. I will definitely 
uh, showcase Benin uh, for our countries to follow as well. Local ownership development is fundamentally local. Thank you so much indeed. We have another country example to compare and to learn more. In this case is about uh, Uzbekistan that in 2021 um, was the first country in the region, as I mentioned, to uh, raise uh, sovereign uh, bonds, SDG bonds, uh, 235 million US dollars with a 14% coupon rate for a period of, th of three years. So we have uh, today a uh, representative. Um, I'm very grateful and uh, pleased to introduce Mr. Obijan Kakimov. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, um, he's the director of Center for Economic Research and Reform under the administration of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan. And um, my question, uh, Mr. Kakimov, is was it easy? Um, can we convince um, investors to uh, put uh, their resources into ESG? Um, sovereign uh, bonds and uh, allow countries to build economies that are more um, conducive to uh, human development as well. So what's the experience of Uzbekistan? Over to you, Mr. Kakimov. Good afternoon, everyone. So the um, as I was introduced already, you know, the, I represent the Center for Economic Research and Reforms. And I, you know, for those who doesn't know, you know, where is Uzbekistan? What kind of country is that? You know, the Uzbekistan is located in the Central Asia. It's right above the Afghanistan. So that it's kind of middle of, you know, the Eurasian continent. And it has about like a 36 million population and, uh, you know, the GDP per capita by the nominal US dollar exchange rate is about like 2,300. So the Uzbekistan got, its independence in 1991 and you know the since you know 2018 you know the the, the new president of the Uzbekistan started like in the swift reforms and if you may uh, I will demonstrate my screen right now so that I have small presentation so uh if I talk about you know the, can you see my presentation okay great great you know if I talk about a little bit about you know uh, SDG history of Uzbekistan. So the yes, we uh, you know the committed you know to do the you know the uh, to implement the global 2030 agenda for sustainable development. But you know the real works in Uzbekistan started like in 2018 October. So that the new president of the Uzbekistan, you know, the Shaukat Mirziyoyev, when he came to the presidency in 2017, we you know the, the started you know the real implementation of this you know, the global agenda. So in 2018, 16 national sustainable development goals and 125 targets were approved and interagency coordination council created and the roadmaps for implementation of all these SDGs are adopted. So that since 2017, Uzbekistan, so if you talk about like, you know, the development side, so the we uh, almost finished like, uh, you know, the two strategies. So the, the, the one, the strategy was like 2017 and 2021 strategy. So this is the five-year strategy. And the 2022-2026 strategy was kind of in the middle. So uh, all these strategies were kind of aligned when we developed all these strategies. So our center was kind of coordinating office so the, all these, you know, the 16 national sustainable development goals and 125 targets were kind of, you know, the, the part of these strategies. So uh, as one of the main components of this SDG, you know, the, the policies Uzbekistan since 2020 said that one of the main economic policy or the priority in Uzbekistan, it will be, you know, the poverty reduction strategy. So in Uzbekistan, we first adopted in 2020 national poverty line and in 2021 and the 22. So what we did is like we reduced in one year by implementing these, you know, the policies. So the poverty rate were reduced from 17% to 14%. So as you can see that by the implementation of this new poverty reduction strategies of the Uzbekistan, policies of the Uzbekistan, only in one year, one million people were lifted. So the, 
as my colleagues already told that, you know, that Uzbekistan, when it comes to the poverty reduction, shifted towards to the what, not the government level or the local government level, we shifted towards the working at the community level. So that the poverty reduction strategies are implementation of these strategies are kind of, you know, the performed by the, at the community level. So in Uzbekistan, as I said already, we have 36 million population, but 10,000, what, uh, you know, the communities. So in 10,000 communities, we implemented a special person who will be responsible for the poverty reduction policies of the Uzbekistan and plus entrepreneurship programs. So that these communities are called the Mahalas. So that's why we call this system, so that we call this new innovation of the poverty reduction innovation as like, you know, the, the Mahalaba system of the Uzbekistan. So uh, as you can see that, you know, the allocation of the public expenditure were increased significantly. And, you know, second thing I would say that, you know, the food security and the clean water and the sanitation. So the, here is the numbers just, the, you know, the to show the, what is happening in Uzbekistan by, by the implementation of all these SDGs. So the, in 2019, if the, you know, the cover, covers with the centralized water supply was 67%, so right now in, in 2022, we increased at 74.4%. So the now we are kind of forming new strategy. Strategy is called like 2023-30. So this is seven year strategy. According to the seven year strategy, we want to achieve 91% of you know, the coverage of the centralized water supply. So the coverage of the centralized sewer system also kind of compared to the 2019, which was about like 15%, we would like to make it about like 31%. So the efficiency of the wastewater system, if it was like in 2019, like 55%, we would like to achieve this one, 80%. So the, you know, Uzbekistan uh, allocates, you know, the high amount of, you know, the, the, the improvement in like, you know, the water efficiency, so for those who doesn't know that the Central Asia is one of the regions of the, you know, the earth, which is kind of having serious problem with the water scarcity. So the, in the next, for example, let's say 10, 15 years, we have two rivers, which is kind of main, you know, the rivers of the Central Asia, which kind of collects about like 80% of the water resources the, the, the resources of these two rivers will decline significantly and, you know, the efficiency of the agriculture will be kind of uh, one of the top issues. And as, you know, the, the Mr. La Fortuna said that, you know, the implementation of, you know, the SDG outcomes or the targets will be depending on these changes and the global changes. So, uh, before uh, kind of, you know, the talking about the bonds, I would like to speak about uh, a little bit about one study, which was kind of done with the, the, the specialists and the, our center also was kind of part of this. I have estimated that those banks needed additional annual spending about like 7.9% of the GDP in order to achieve like this 2030 SDG goals. So if you look to the distribution of the 7.9%, Highest portion goes to the what the health sector, it's about like 3.4 percent, and the infrastructure it's about like 2.4 percent, one percent on the water, and the 0.8 percent on the electricity, and the 0.3 percent on the education. So, as a second country in the global, it was Pakistan also first time implement uh, you know the issue of this SDG bonds. So, if I talk about this SDG bonds, 235 million dollars with the 14%, so that the one thing that, you know, the Uzbekistan in these five years, uh, not only issued the SDG bonds, it also started like kind of becoming part of the global financial. So until 2017, we never issued not only SDG, but any bonds in the global financial markets. So the, in the short time periods, we issued, we participated in the global financial markets, we issued our first bonds and we are kind of the second country, you know, the as issued SDG bonds in the local currency. So this is a 14% coupon as a local currency. So, uh, you know, the, the when this bond was issued, as you can see that, you know, the bond 
the revenue, which is like $235 million worth of, you know, the resources were, you know, the directly and indirectly contributed to the total of 11 SDGs of the Uzbekistan. So these are the health services. So that these are the components of like 311.8, education, sustainable water supply and the waste management and the efficient energy production and the consumption and the deliver of the clean transportation services. So the pollution and the prevention of the control, prevention and control and sustainable management of living natural resources and the land use. As you can see that, so that these $235 million were kind of directly or sometimes indirectly contributed to the improvement of these SDGs. So if you look to the allocation of the SDG bonds, like 54% went to the transportation system, which is kind of, you know, the contributes and environment, you know, the, the, the also other parts, health, education, and the water system. So if I talk about it geographically, Uzbekistan has 14, you know, the uh, regions, yes, 14 oblasts, we call it, yes. So as you can see that the, uh, the majority part of this 14, uh, you know, the, the, the SDG bonds were allocated to the, what, the Tashkent city, Namangan, Andijan, and the Fergana Valley. And as you can see that, that these regions are uh, accounts, you know, the high portion of our population, more dense. So if you, if you see this Andijan, so the Andijan region is considered as most dense the populated area of the Uzbekistan. So it's also kind of benefiting more people. And it's also kind of, you know, the, the going to the towards the regions where we have more, you know, the, 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 the demand for these kind of resources. Yes, you know, the, this is kind of what the good example. And I think that, you know, the, 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 this experience should be shared. And I think that, you know, the, uh, uh, not only 235 million, so as I said before, like we also had this demand about like 7.9% of our, uh, you know, the gross domestic product. So if I talk about like Uzbekistan's, uh, you know, the gross domestic product is about like $81 billion. So the, as you can see, the 8% of this, it's about like, you know, the eight, uh, you know, the seven, eight billion dollar worth of demand for further implementation of our SDGs. So the, what we are doing right now that we are kind of dividing all these, you know, the, the components to the three parts. One portion is kind of, we are kind of transferring some components to the private sector. Some components are, we are kind of directing to the private public partnership system and the, some components to the what, directed to the only government, you know, the, the, the projects. So as you can see that demand for these SDG level bonds will be kind of, you know, the, the importance of this SDG level bonds will be higher and higher. So uh, what I think that the, my uh, opinion is that, you know, the, the, to make this issues of these bonds will be more and more important for the developing countries. So one thing that, you know, the, as you can see what's happening in these days that, you know, the, the interest rates as, you know, the uh, Mr. Lafortine said that interest rates are going up globally. So this is already making issuing not only SDG bonds, but any bonds for developing economies making more and more kind of, you know, the difficult. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for if I take a longer time. Mr. Kakimov, thank you so very much. Uh, fascinating presentation. I noted uh, the reference to policy coherence as an important, and I'm hoping uh, you can hear me uh, okay. Uh, the policy coherence as an important approach to ensuring that the money is best uh, used, the focus on poverty reduction, also on uh, key uh, resources, vital resources that are needed, such as um, access to water supply and um, for the efficiency of agriculture, and also the interesting analysis of the financing gap that uh, the country has in terms of advancing uh, the SDGs. I'm confident that through the use of the current line of bonds, uh, Uzbekistan will improve its borrowing position, so it's going to be much easier in the future 
to mobilize uh, resources. And again, another way to help investors understand that returns on their money should not be only money, but also the public good, the social good, the environmental good that they actually uh, create. The next speaker, thank you again very much, Mr. Kakimo. The next speaker is the budget director uh, in the government of the Republic of Benin in the Ministry of um, Economy and, and Finance, who will walk us a little bit on how exactly the process of um, uh, budgeting um, uh, the SDGs as well as using uh, external resources that primarily into financing the SDGs actually works in Benin. Again, another way to learn more and share with other countries that wish to learn from Benin. Um, I would like to give the floor to you, Mr. Shaul. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Je suis Rodrigue Chaou, directeur général du budget. Donc, sur la question, il faut rappeler que l'approche de planification adoptée par le Bénin s'arrive sur les normes internationales. Donc, il y a d'abord la stratégie au niveau national qui est déclinée dans les documents ministériels. Donc, nous venons à l'opérationnel puis au niveau des plans d'investissement. Donc, par rapport à l'alignement des ODD sur le budget de l'État, le Bénin s'inscrit dans une nouvelle gouvernance budgétaire, donc une gestion budgétaire en mode programme. Nous avons 17 ODD, donc à partir des stratégies ministérielles, nous avons bâti des programmes budgétaires qui sont cohérentes avec les 17 objectifs ODD. Donc voilà au plan budgétaire le point de départ pour s'assurer que, à terme, les ressources budgétaires puissent adresser efficacement les besoins de population qui sont inscrits dans les 17 objectifs. Le, la deuxième chose que le Bénin a faite en la matière, comme le Bénin est un pays principalement à ressources fiscales, nous n'avons pas les moyens importants d'inscrire toutes les cibles. Le Bénin a travaillé à ériger une matrice de cibles prioritaires. Donc, euh, en la matière, les priorités, c'est d'abord le social, puisque le gouvernement, dans son plan d'action, en a fait un pilier majeur à travers le pilier amélioration des conditions de vie des populations. Et là, nous avons un nouveau étendu, notre modèle social, qui repose désormais sur, je dirais, cinq axes stratégiques. Le premier axe stratégique, c'est d'abord la promotion des transferts sociaux aux couches vulnérables, puisque, comme vous le savez, le nombre de populations vulnérables dans notre pays n'est pas négligeable. Donc, le gouvernement travaille d'arrache-pied en mettant en place des transferts sociaux. Des transferts sociaux. Le second axe concerne le renforcement des services d'action sociale. Le troisième consiste à étendre le système d'assurance sociale aux petits emplois. C'est également un axe majeur de la politique du gouvernement. Le quatrième axe met l'accent sur le renforcement du capital humain à travers un grand programme que vous connaissez certainement, le, pro, le programme H, Assurance maladie pour le renforcement du capital humain. Et enfin, le dernier axe stratégique concerne la consolidation et la modernisation du cadre législatif et réglementaire. Donc, par rapport aux politiques sociales qui est privilégiée dans les actions ODD du gouvernement, le Bénin a fait des actions majeures. Je pourrais donner quelques exemples. D'abord, dans le secteur de l'éducation, le Bénin a accéléré le programme national intégré des cantines scolaires. C'est un programme phare du gouvernement qui consiste à donner aux enfants deux repas chauds par jour. Et en 2017, le taux de couverture des écoles à cantines scolaires était de 31 mais depuis la rentrée de septembre, le Bénin est passé à une couverture de 75 Donc, aujourd'hui, nous avons plus d'un million d'enfants 
qui mangent deux fois par jour des repas sains, mais qui ont également accès à l'eau potable, puisque la politique, comme je l'ai dit, c'est une politique intégrée. Toutes les écoles qui bénéficient de cantines scolaires disposent en même temps des systèmes d'eau potable. Donc, les deux vont de pair pour permettre également à assurer l'hygiène et l'assainissement en milieu scolaire. Allô? Allô? Je peux continuer? Il y a des interférences, on dirait. Uh, Donc, the, uh, Mr. Shao, please, please um, uh, continue. We, you still have two minutes. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you. Okay. Thank you. Donc, uh, en termes de perspective pour le programme euh, cantine scolaire, le gouvernement euh, envisage de réaliser euh, l'accès universel avant la fin du quinquennat qui est en cours. Donc, avant 2026. Et là, 1,8 million d'enfants béninois et collés béninois auront accès à l'alimentation saine, à l'eau potable en milieu scolaire, mais également toutes les écoles qui sont dans des milieux ruraux seront couvertes. Donc ça, c'est un programme important. Le, programme, le second programme que je voulais évoquer ici, c'est le programme SWEAT, qui est un programme appuyé par la Banque mondiale depuis trois ans. C'est un programme dont l'objectif principal est de maintenir les filles à l'école, notamment les filles qui sont issues des familles défavorisées. Et là, les leviers de ce programme, de ce projet, sont de deux sortes. D'abord, il a opéré des transferts monétaires aux filles et dans le même temps, des kits scolaires sont mis à leur disposition pour les aider à rester dans, en classe. Ce programme va au-delà pour l'encouragement des filles en ciblant principalement les filles qui s'inscrivent dans les séries techniques, mais également scientifiques. Et là, il est alloué un peu moins d'un dollar par jour et pour 22 jours le mois, mais sur toute la période de la rentrée et sur la durée de vie du projet, cette allocation aux filles qui ont été identifiées dans les 77 communes de notre pays. Donc, c'est un, un programme qui clôture en 2024, mais pour lequel les résultats déjà obtenus sont vraiment élogieux et témoignent, bien sûr, du taux de, de progrès observé sur le taux de rétention, mais également le taux de scolarisation des filles dans les écoles de notre pays. Ce programme a été complété à la rentrée dernière par un programme soutenu également par la Banque mondiale qui vise à étendre les, étendre les onérations des, des frais de contribution des filles au niveau du premier cycle du secondaire. Donc, c'est un programme, deux programmes qui s'articulent et qui se complètent et dont l'objectif est d'encourager la scolarisation, mais également la rétention des filles au secondaire et également les aider à se professionnaliser une fois qu'elles auraient eu leur baccalauréat. Je voudrais parler rapidement, je sais que le temps passe très vite, d'un programme également important que j'ai cité qui vise à renforcer les services d'action sociale. Là, c'est un programme que le gouvernement a récemment mis en place et qui envisage de faire la promotion des personnes handicapées dans notre pays. Donc, ces personnes handicapées auront accès de façon discriminée au concours dans la fonction publique, aux allocations universitaires. Il aura un écart, en tout cas une allocation complémentaire de plus que les personnes en situation normale. Ces personnes auront également accès à taux subventionnés au centre de loisirs, mais également au transport en commun. Et ce programme mettra bientôt en place également 
un système d'accès au crédit pour susciter l'entrepreneuriat au sein de cette couche de la population que constituent les personnes handicapées dans notre pays. À côté de ça, il y a les personnes qui sont en situation de mendicité. Pour la plupart, c'est des enfants qui viennent des pays voisins du Bénin, mais pour lesquels le gouvernement a décidé l'année prochaine de créer un centre d'assistance à ces enfants qui sont en situation de mendicité pour lesquels le budget alloue des moyens très importants. Bon, j'observe que je suis passé déjà largement au-delà du temps qui m'a accordé. Je pourrais répondre à des questions en cas de besoin. Merci. Monsieur Chao, merci beaucoup. What a great lesson of good governance uh, you provided to us. Uh, indeed, it is about uh, planning and prioritization in uh, budget uh, strategies. It's also extremely important to invest in people if we want the um, use of funds to generate a more sustainable future. Uh, amazing commitments to universal coverage, uh, both of um, social um, services as well as uh, of some of the financial components of uh, social protection systems would uh, transfer to uh, uh, the poor to be able to spend, to contribute to growth. Uh, great programs also with uh, the World Bank, we took note of that. Um, the ruralization of the agenda, which is um, important to reduce internal gaps in development in country and the school feeding program, amazing. Uh, congratulations, this is, Absolutely great for uh, all attending the, um, uh, our meeting today, as well as for us to further disseminate with other countries. So thank you so very much. Um, I think we should uh, balance out a little bit uh, the panel discussions to bring in an international uh, financial institution, the International Monetary Fund at this point to help us understand how um, IMF is supporting debt managers in uh, developing countries to ensure that ESG debt is managed uh, sustainably. Again, we walk on a very thin line. Confidence needs to be maintained. Again, return on such investments would need to be uh, sustainable. Uh, countries are uh, desperately trying to reduce the level of indebtedness and again, focus the use of that, uh, raising that for the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. Um, Mr. Chung, uh, Kei Chung, uh, who is a senior researcher at the IMF, I know you've produced an interesting uh, paper with guidelines for that managers together with uh, Peter Lindner. Uh, is there something that we would need to learn um, in terms of how that management ESG that could be more sustainable? I know the IMF produced a uh, good uh, chapter four report on Benin. It looks like there is trust that Benin will be able to manage properly the debt. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Chung. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. I am Kei Chong from the IMF, International Monetary Fund from Washington, DC, and very happy to join here. So as uh, uh, this uh, discussion is going, the ESG debt market rapidly expanded in recent years and the uh, issuance of uh, sovereign debt that meet the environmental, social, or governance uh, objective is opening a new financing opportunity for many sovereign borrowers. So against this uh, backdrop, we wrote this working paper, IMF working paper, to provide uh, guidance to the issuer of sovereign ESG bond, particularly for the developing countries. So in this paper, we provide an overview of um, ESG financing options uh, based on many countries' uh, practices. There are many types of uh, ESG bond, like SDG bond in uh, Uzbekistan and also many green bonds you're familiar with and social bonds and sustainability bond and sustainably linked bonds and there are many financing options uh, that is already practiced by many countries and we also introduced a good overview of, uh, based on the analysis of uh, what is operational requirements, what could be the additional cost that could this could entail. So we, our uh, working paper uh, provide this kind of a good overview of this. 
So our findings, uh, first, um, we realized that the additional requirements must be met uh, for sovereign to issue ESG related debt and to raise uh, funding for in the objective of ESG, particularly like uh, additional capacity such as um, cross departmental or cross ministry cooperation. So this was mentioned in yeah, Mushira Fortune and also Kakimusa presentation. Many developing countries, we found that uh, they are uh, ha having a uh, specific to many developing countries, they're facing challenges in institutional arrangement because this ESG bond, this is the first time they ever have to coordinate across ministry. Many uh, ESG objectives, the most common objectives we identified is uh, clean transportation and clean energy and clean water management. And the Minister of Finance uh, didn't have to work closely with this uh, line ministry to get the budget allocation. And this was a new institutional challenges that uh, many developing countries are facing when they're trying to raise the funding for this area. So additional capacity is needed and also uh, their communication with the investors, investor relations, this new capacity is uh, uh, to sell their ESG bond, ESG objective. So this kind of uh, additional capacity must be met before they consider. And secondly, so we focus on the developing countries. It's uh, in the same line. And uh, generally, uh, advanced economy, you can see in the market that most of the green bonds are you know, issued by advanced economy. And advanced economy have um, relatively deeper financing domestic markets so they can finance themselves in their local currency in domestic market and uh, this affects a uh, risk or like exchange uh, con concern is uh, not their priority and they're riskless but many developing countries they have a limitation developing their domestic debt market uh, particular local currency debt market and they cannot meet um, many countries having difficulty meeting that finding uh, funding, raising the funding in their domestic markets. So they have to rely on the international capital market. And this can be a new experience to many developing countries, particularly when it comes to ESG bonds, they have to have uh, this framework, they have to have objectives. And this is uh, another layer that uh, part, uh, particularly concerns the developing countries. And the thirdly, uh, we found that the objective of uh, ESG issuance, the innovative financing have to be well integrated with the public debt management strategy. So many countries public debt management strategy is um, aligned as uh, they want to meet the funding at the low cost with the reasonable risk. Uh, this has to be when you consider uh, raising money or ESG objective, this has to be factored into your total cost and risk analysis of your debt portfolio. So uh, issuing the innovative financing instruments like SDG bond or ESG bond can sometimes hamper price discovery in the primary market or reduce the liquidity in the secondary market and which can affect the cost of the borrowing. And that has to be analyzed in that uh, your analysis. And this has to be integrated with the debt management objective and debt management strategy. So before issuing, there are like various factors that needs to be considered. And uh, this has to be well aligned with uh, your public debt management strategy. Particularly, you have to be aware of the cost and risk that might come and you have to be uh, you have to be able to understand uh, what may happen. And uh, fourth, uh, we found that the uh, innovative financing options are available both in um, private sector and the official sector sources. So it is a uh, now, as I said, the ESG market has expanded so rapidly. There's a this is a very um, big uh, push and demand in the private sector. So there's a, it's very attractive way to raise money with the possibly based, based on the demand and supply mismatch. We see some uh, Renewum as well, but Renewum is in debate at the moment. And, uh, but the 
there's definitely a benefit of raising money in the private sector, but there's also option in the official sector financing. Official sector financing is normally available from the bilateral or multilateral sources and often on concessional terms. And when considering this uh, market-based ESG bond issuance, sovereigns should evaluate if their project uh, is qualified for the concessional financing from the public sources. So it may require more scrutiny on the project quality, and uh, it may take some more time. It may, uh, it, the money may be dispersed at a slower pace, but the cost saving is significant when you uh, go to the official sector financing. So that should be the another, another factor that you have to consider when you're thinking about innovative financing. So this is a very important new area for the IMF uh, to work on. And uh, as you may be aware that we also have a Resilient Sustainability Trust RST fund to help the low-income countries and vulnerable middle-income countries particularly address this long-term challenges, including climate finance or pandemic preparedness or social issues. So uh, we, other than IMF, yeah, World Bank, and many other in international financial institutions is uh, trying to provide uh, help to guide to the right direction and uh, not looking for I mean, more of a non-monetary payoff we are looking for. And uh, that is uh, another way that uh, we should definitely remember and pursue. So I can stop here. Yeah. Ms. Chunks, thank you so much. Uh, great analysis and great advice to uh, countries willing to take this avenue. We take note of the cross-ministry cooperation issues, the communication with investors. I think that's an area where um, the United Nations on the ground uh, has helped us as well. So I'm aware of, uh, for instance, that in Uzbekistan, uh, the United Nations uh, was one of the partners along the process. Uh, some very interesting um, analysis also of um, the cost analysis that needs to be done, the opportunities um, in private and official public um, sector financing markets, and also your reference to the RST. Um, I also noted that in the commitment uh, that came out of the Paris summit, we speak about uh, from the World Bank, for instance, uh, some 25% more uh, IDA countries that are able to receive uh, financing in IDA terms, but also the uh, potential uh, reallocation of uh, the unused uh, SDRs for financing. One thing that I would add here is that Benin is part of the uh, very vulnerable countries. Uzbekistan also has its vulnerabilities. So we very much hope that within this space of financing and financing for development, concessional financing, most, uh, most importantly, we will have some uh, changes this year with um, uh, partnership that we hope we are going to have together with the World Bank and other financial institutions on the adoption of uh, the uh, specific metric measuring vulnerability to be added to the GNI per capita. But again, we appreciate the role that the IMF is uh, playing in advising and ensuring that uh, governments uh, safely uh, borrow and again, build more confidence uh, as they uh, access the market. So, so much for that we have two important uh, speakers uh, towards the uh, conclusion of our uh, dialogues who come with different uh, perspectives. Um, I will uh, give uh, first the floor to um, uh, Ms. Camille uh, Barret, uh, who works as a socially responsible investment uh, advisor at Mirova, who is very familiar with both uh, the case of uh, Benin and uh, Uzbekistan. Um, the current financial conditions are not always very favorable for developing countries. Uh, that's, again, why we are discussing uh, redesigning the development uh, financing um, system at this point in time. Uh, what is your perspective, again, being familiar with the uh, ESG targeted financing from your uh, very particular uh, standpoint? So, Camille, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. And um, hi, everyone. And thank you for having me over at the United Nations High Level Political Forum. Maybe before diving into my answer, I'd like to introduce a little bit Marova to give a little bit of context in our philosophy. Uh, Marova is an affiliate of Natixis Investment Managers, and we're fully dedicated to sustainable investment. We are a mission-driven company, B Corp label certified, and all of our asset classes are 100% covered by the SFDR, so the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, classified under Article 9. I don't know if everyone is uh, aware of this SFDR and what Article 9 means, but an Article 9 fund under the SFDR is defined as a fund that has a sustainable investment as its objective. That means that at Merova, we seek a positive social environmental impact as well as a financial outperformance with our funds. So the SDGs provide investors with a framework for examining the resilience of their assets in the face of outgoing and transformations. And they even make it possible for us to go further and consider the exposure of investment to the development of new solutions and new economic models. So that's why we at Marova chose the SDG framework to guide our ESG investments and assessments. Um, so we strongly favor sustainability, SDG, green and or social bonds compared to conventional bonds, because it's easier to track the impact and to see quickly the link between the structure of the bonds framework and the SDGs. So to answer your question, so we look at many different things when we're looking at a SDG bond for uh, emerging markets or developing economies, notably via those type of frameworks. So the first most important for us is the use of proceeds and the quality of the project and its allocation. We really want to see this transparency and clear description of the use of proceeds of the bond to understand as best as possible the project that will be financed with it and how they're answering the real challenges of the country. This helps us determine the potential positive contribution of the bond towards improving the country's SDG goals. And maybe it might be a bit controversial to say, but less is more. Sometimes we have we see a lot of use of proceeds and it's not always the best to concentrate on key crucial aspects, even though we do understand that the issuer wants to touch as many SDGs as possible, but sometimes it can kind of be to the detriment of the efficiency and the final impact that it actually wants to have. A second point that is really important to us is the coherence, and that's I've heard it mentioned by all of the speakers uh, before on this panel, the coherence between this SDG framework and the country's own agenda. The link between the use of proceeds and the country's SDG goal is important to us to understand if the use of proceeds are being allocated towards the critical aspects for the country and in line with their agenda. It's also crucial for us to make sure that the country is not obstructing any of the SDG. Going back to do not significant harm, it's important to contribute, but also not to have an obstruction. So of course we look at repeated controversies, high potential risk on any of the SDGs that could be linked. And I think the last point is the integrity of the of the transaction. We want to see the we want to see an impact in an allocation report showing a high level of transparency with pertinent impact indicators destined to ensure the credibility of the transaction and to be able to measure the effects of the projects that have been chosen. And if it's audited, it's always a plus for us to make sure that everything that is being said is uh, is uh, is true to form. We also look at the governance. I know that is something that is that is mentioned and the committee that will choose the eligibility of the projects. Who is around that table? Who is making sure that the projects are in line with the, SG, the SDG goals? Who are making sure that the risk management is of those projects are being taken into account? We also look at the look back period of the projects and the split between the refinancing and financing of those projects. How long ago does these projects date from? Are they new? Are they recent? How are they going to work? So this is a bit of how what our job is as an ESG or SRI analyst when we're analyzing an SDG bond and uh, as a responsible investor. Kami, uh, thank you so much. A very interesting uh, perspective from an asset uh, um, manager. Um, I noted uh, the uh, importance that you attach to the SDG framework as being practically the foundation of the um, formulation of uh, financing needs. Uh, also, um, the analysis that you do on the use of proceeds um, and the fact that you believe that focusing on key interventions that may show an interlink with all the SDGs is the best approach rather than 
um, you know, scattering, taking a scattering a type of investment that would minimize the returns and maybe not give an opportunity for stronger linkages across the uh, SDG targets. Um, uh, the coherence, again, that was mentioned, but the most important part is on the integrity of the transaction, the reporting um, requirements that need to be met, uh, all so the auditing that would add a little bit of more confidence to the investors and uh, who makes the decisions, uh, what exactly is the stage of the uh, project. Those are important components for um, our government partners to consider as they aim to attract more investors in the financial market. So thank you so much. Appreciate your intervention. Our last speaker today is uh, Mr. Cedric uh, Mer who is the head of Center of Expertise and Innovation and uh, ESG uh, coverage for SSA as the, at the Natifix uh, Green and Sustainable uh, Hub. Uh, SSA that, as we all know, is a sovereign, supranational and agency that, um, a debt that is a, a little easier to uh, raise, I believe. But anyway, we will hear from uh, Cedric uh, as your presence on the panel is extremely valuable, you have supported Benin uh, in the operation, you're familiar with other cases. Again, Benin and Uzbekistan are the most important among developing countries. Mexico also tried years back and uh, launched an SDG bond as the, uh, Indonesia as well, but Benin and Uzbekistan are important for us to learn from. So what's your assessment uh, a few years later, two years later? on the uh, current um, uh, debt uh, raised and the management of the debt and the progress towards the SDGs and what are the prospects for other developing countries to be able to do the same? Cedric, over to you. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, so you're, 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 you're right. So Benin issued uh, back in, uh, in July 2021 uh, its inaugural SDG bond. It was a 500 million uh, uh, euro bond with a maturity of 12.5 uh, years. Um, at that moment, uh, it was not deemed to be a one-off. Uh, Benin intended to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be recurrent. Uh, but because of, uh, of market conditions and because of interest rate increase, which have dramatically uh, uh, surged, it's becoming more challenging. Uh, the bond was priced uh, at around 5% and it's no worth more than uh, 9%. Uh, but luckily, and thanks to sound debt management, Benin is not facing uh, a strong euro debt uh, refinancing constraints on the short term. So there is no uh, uh, such a pressure for the moment. Uh, but what is very important is that the international market uh, turned adverse for countries like Benin, but the Republic did not drop its sustainability commitment. And I think that level of dedication is very, uh, is, is very essential. So what has been accomplished, uh, we have had before the inaugurations all the costing exercise, the prioritization of the targets. But now, uh, over the last few years, we, ha we have had a greater annual tracking progress uh, of the SDGs, a clear identification of the remaining gaps, notably thanks to the, uh, the SDSN. So in terms of accountability and dialogue, uh, things have really improved uh, and policy dialogues and reform are, are, are well underway. Uh, and I think it helps uh, in the perception of Benin by, by market participants. So Benin won uh, uh, several awards, and now it's really recognized uh, by some international investors, but also by other issuers as a, 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 as a best practice, especially when it comes to impact reporting. Uh, and we come to that point about the second impact reporting, uh, which will be released uh, in, the, in, in the coming days, uh, sticking to the, the commitments uh, taken in front of, uh, of investors. Uh, but the procedures, the governance, and the capabilities have, uh, have improved. So in this second report, uh, annual impact report, uh, the Benin shows that it, uh, it delivers on its promises. There is a clear identification of the, of the beneficiaries. Uh, we have uh, international data. So looking at municipality level and, and tracking some uh, dynamics, territorial dynamics, uh, we'll have a focus on, the, uh, on leaving no one behind. 
with some uh, a deep dive into some uh, uh, segments of the populations. And we have a, a, a rather uh, compelling approach uh, around interleakages on the, on the SDGs. And if we have a few uh, flagship uh, uh, pr uh, uh, programs on, uh, on support to uh, entrepreneurial farmers, uh, uh, focus on schools, uh, which are now provided with canteens, uh, waste collection uh, improvement in many, uh, in many municipalities. So that's what is being provided by Benin. So what are the perspectives? So of course we need to innovate. We need to find out new mechanisms in this context of a high uh, interest rates. Credit enhancements are really necessary with the involvement of DFI. So when public issuances are a bit complex, uh, we need to find out loans with guarantees and, and credit enhancement for, uh, uh, from DFI, which allow to involve private investors. Uh, in the funding of, uh, of countries like Benin. Uh, there are a lot of talks and, and thinking about nature conservation programs, uh, biodiversity or carbon offset, uh, which are sometimes fraught with greenwashing. So we also must be cautious about that in the design and to avoid uh, uh, shortcomings. Uh, but my personal belief is that when the market condition will improve, Benin will be well positioned because we now have a greater track record the authorities have shown dedication and long-term commitments. Policy consistency is key. And uh, when we talk with investors, they are uh, always concerned for low and, and middle income countries about implementation and enforcement. And what Benin has been doing over the last few years is to show such consistency. So I'm rather optimistic about, uh, about Benin. Uh, Despite the international context and the multifaceted crisis, uh, there is progress, there is a political uh, consistency and, uh, and a greater accountability uh, and transparency, which is really underpinning system finance. Cedric, thank you so much. Um, uh, great concluding points, uh, I would think, but let me just mention a few. Um, the fact that you've identified uh, dedication as an important factor, as an enabler to ensure that such innovative financing actually happens and it will uh, utilize the fact that by um, embarking on ESG borrowing, um, countries need to prioritize their targets, need to have stronger monitoring and accountability. Also uh, extremely important, as you mentioned, the impact reporting, uh, the capacity to generate data that would allow us to look um, how much the impact at the municipality level has been. Also uh, the focus on flagship programs in uh, Benin uh, that um, bring social value, uh, looking into supporting more sustainable farming, but also uh, schools and school feeding, the waste collection that improve quality of life. and. Um, also, the innovative um, mechanisms that need to be adopted, considering that uh, rates uh, remain um, high, uh, interest rates, and uh, the DFI part to uh, bring in private investment. Uh, you also mentioned uh, some other uh, areas that would need to be considered, um, but I just wanted, we haven't touched upon that. It would have been interesting to also discuss other state uh, conditions. Yeah, that I can, I can mention. Swaps. Yes, I please. Can, I can mention one. We have been working uh, with the Republic of Senegal, uh, which is to release a, a, a framework with, uh, a, with uh, two formats, user for seed and uh, KPI linked. So there, there were a lot of talks about sustainability link bonds over, over the last few years. So this is another development uh, which can inspire other countries. And uh, we really see, in a, especially in Africa, some emulation between countries and lot of, uh, a lot of willingness and, uh, and needs. Of course, we, we are fully aware of the needs, uh, but I think this is, uh, this is quite promising. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we wish we had more time. So um, SDSN, uh, Guillaume Lafortune, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you so very much for giving me this privilege to moderate uh, the discussion. Uh, much gratitude to the government of Benin, to uh, the government of Uzbekistan for joining us uh, today. Um, I wish uh, we could have also some of the most vulnerable countries attending to listen and learn from Benin and Uzbekistan. Um, I would Sorry, Simon, conclude... just, maybe yes, just please. one more remark before we close because I think there were a few changes as uh, all of you have noticed on the on the program and uh, for some reason I, I believe Minister Vagani couldn't join us today. Uh, but I just wanted to mention uh, because I thought it would be mentioned in his intervention that 
as part of what Cedric was saying on this continuous focus on sustainability in uh, Benin that um, we're launching the report today and we're about to launch also an SDSN network um, in Benin um, to strengthen capacity for um, science-based pathways, policies, planning, monitoring that is um, locally uh, based. And this network will be co-piloted by the University of Abome uh, Calvi and the Department of Research and Strategic Studies at the Ministry of Economy and Finance. I just thought this was important uh, also in this um, continuous engagement uh, on the SDGs in, in Benin. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, no, thank you. Great, great addition to uh, the discussion, uh, Guillaume. Um, this is the year when we talk about SDG progress. We are going to have, as you mentioned at the beginning, the SDG summit uh, later on alongside the General Assembly, the 78th uh, General Assembly uh, Climate Action Summit. We will also look into progress on uh, financing for development uh, in the follow-up of Paris, but also ahead of, of uh, the Marrakesh meeting and uh, um, after the uh, G20 uh, summit this year, and also um, a series of other internal discussions in the international financial space to ensure countries have the necessary resources to move forward. So there is commitment, there is coherence, there is alignment, uh, national and subnational uh, levels. Uh, there is a readiness uh, by investors to uh, finance uh, public good, uh, social good, environmental good, uh, as well as um, economic uh, development. Uh, should we all come together with solidarity, with commitment to ensuring that the planet, our community will have a safer future. So I wish to thank SDSN. We will soon release also a report on the progress on small island developing states uh, on the SDGs, as well as a financing gap. Maybe to conclude, uh, SDSN put forward a paper showing that good progress uh, towards the SDGs requires a minimum of 18,000 US dollars public outlays, public spending per capita. Most of the uh, countries, vulnerable countries are far below. So we need access to financing to make things happen. Countries need means to be able to develop sustainably. Thank you so much. My name is Simona Marinescu. A big honor to have been with you today. Thank you, uh, distinguished speakers, everybody in the audience, um, and you, the government of Benin, uh, the government of Uzbekistan, and uh, Guillaume at SDSN. Thank you. And Thank the, you I, so much, Simona. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank Simona. You. It was great.